thank you everyone for joining today, um, the ones who joined us now. Uh, we're going to be talking about cross-platform security operations for your Zero Trust journey. And in today's webinar, um, we at D3 Security are hosting C Scaler um, to talk about our integration together um, and how we can both collectively help you on your Zero Trust journey. Um, it's going to be very exciting and uh, it's uh, going to give you a lot of ideas um, to implement and a lot of best practices that are going to be shared by our two distinguished speakers. So um, I'm just um, going to get uh, right into it with a little housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. We'll have a live q and at the end. I would encourage all of you to ask questions. You could type them in the chat and we'll answer them as they come up. Um, the best question from the audience is going to receive a $50 gift voucher. So, you know, that's always an extra incentive to ask questions and not hold back. Uh, a little bit about D3. We're an independent sole vendor, the number one independent sole vendor. Some of the world's largest organizations use D3 to manage their security operations center. We literally are like the command center for a SOC. And the, some, some of our clients include the world's top five stock exchanges, um, two out of five of the largest US companies, the top five MDR providers. Um, we also work with a lot of MSSPs to help them deliver MSSP services to their end customers. And in a sense, um, the proof of the uh, of the value that we create is really, you know, the time that we save for our customers. So we're going to talk about this and a lot more in uh, the slides coming up. Um, let me quickly introduce our speaker. Stan Engelbert is the Director of Cybersecurity Practice at D3. He has been with D3 for over six years now, advises security teams and leadership globally in different capacities. He's also the current president of the Vancouver ISC2 chapter and the Vancouver Security Special Interest Group. Our speaker from C Scaler, Rahim, is the director of Technology Alliances. He manages technology partners and is a strong supporter of D3. Prior to Zscaler, he's uh, worked with some of the world's leading organizations like Docker, VMware, Cisco, and also with several startups. Rahim is based in one of my favorite cities in San Francisco Bay Area. So um, without much ado, I want to hand it over uh, first to Rahim to sort of go over um, what Zscaler is and how you approach the journey of Zero Trust. Rahim, it's over to you. Thanks, thanks, Amadeep. Can you can you hear me, Aaron? Right? Yep, we can hear you fine. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, so I want to spend a couple of slides talking about uh, Zscaler, our products, uh, the solution, some of the problems we see in security. But first, if you're not familiar with Zscaler, um, Zscaler was founded about 12 years ago. Uh, knowing security had to transform uh, with companies adopting uh, SaaS technologies and cloud technologies. As companies undergo their digital transformation journeys and adopt Zero Trust, they have tended to, to turn to Zscaler. So Zscaler pioneered this uh, platform called Zero Trust Exchange that sits in over about 150 data centers across the world. Uh, we securely connect users, uh, devices, workloads over uh, any network. We are recognized as a leader in Zero Trust. Um, uh, two years ago, we were, were the only leader left in the Gartner Secure Web Gateway Magic Quadrant. And in the latest Gartner SSC Magic Quadrant, we are also recognized as a leader. With over uh, 12 years of experience running the, one of the world's largest security clouds, we protect over 5,600 customers worldwide and see uh, about 260 billion daily transactions. Um, so just as a point of reference, 260 billion daily transactions, that's like 10 times uh, more 
uh, than Google searches per day. So it's, it's quite a large number, it's very large scale. Our customers include one of the, some of the largest companies in the world uh, across multiple different verticals. So some proof points from our customers, GE has said that once they turn to Zscaler, their employees accessing internet apps enjoy 80% faster speeds. NOV, a uh, uh, Fortune 500 company, was constantly re-imaging their endpoint devices due to infections or um, problems due to threats. After deploying Zscaler, they saw a 35x reduction in this activity. Siemens uh, saw a huge savings on infrastructure as part of the transformation journey. And this is attributable to uh, you know, uh, no more virtual machines, no more cost to manage, getting rid of expensive links. Uh, by adopting a zero trust architecture would help customers accelerate their digital transformation and in the process uh, deliver better user experience, uh, reduce risks and reduce cost. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. So um, traditional security has been built around the hub and spoke architecture. So branches, users all connect back to the data center. So this, this worked reasonably well when you consider that the data center was really the center of gravity of all your apps and data. However, the technology we use, the way we work has all changed, right? With, with app transformation, apps have moved uh, from within the data center uh, into the cloud, adopting things like SaaS and cloud resources. Uh, as you know, users have moved outside of offices, outside of branches, outside of that network perimeter uh, to work from anywhere. Uh, branches are now doing local internet breakouts uh, to get better experience so that they can actually go direct to the internet and then, some, and then they pivot back into the data center when they need to. All this is leading to a need for uh, security transformation. Users need that same protection, right? Uh, no matter whether they're working from home uh, uh, or working from the office. Uh, they don't want to go hairpin traffic back to the data center just to get the benefit of the same set of appliances there. The Zscaler Zero Trust Exchange provides that uniform protection for users, for workloads, with security delivered in the cloud. Um, so by adopting Zscaler, you get a security transformation which helps you reduce cyber risk, uh, reduce complexity, uh, and actually gains you a lot of uh, telemetry uh, that you might have been missing before. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so diving a little deeper into the hub and spoke model that we talked about a second ago, let's take a look at some of the risks. So branches, uh, branch offices essentially extend the network, right? The, from the data center to the office. They, they do this with these private links or site-to-site or, or -site, -site VPNs. Remote users getting access to apps require uh, them to use the VPN to get into the data center. Um, with VPNs, you're extending your network to all your users across all locations. So if you think about that for a minute, now you are extending your network across so many different locations, you've basically increased your attack vectors. Infrastructure in the cloud is also extended using firewalls, site-to-site -site connectivity. Each of those branches, access points, users are all uh, tar attack uh, target vectors, essentially. As users go out to the internet when they're working from home, they tend to bypass the VPN. And uh, by doing this, basically, you now no longer get that uh, stack of security, the protection from the stack of security appliances you find in the data center. And bypassing this really has the problem of the malicious uh, content that they go direct to the internet can actually get downloaded onto their endpoints. Once an endpoint is infected, they connect back to the VPN and they, uh, threats can actually spread and laterally move across the entire network. In fact, this is um, uh, what happened in the NotPetya attack. Once the uh, once a threat has laterally moved and, and, and taken position within the network, data can then be exfiltrated, uh, sent to different cloud file services, encrypted to bypass detections. So the key thing here is extending your network increases your attack surface. Um, users will be attacked by uh, the you know techniques you, you see today: phishing, uh, infrastructure attack by misconfigurations, unpatched machines 
once once a breach occurs, the attackers move laterally to exfiltrate data, demand ransom, or really lurk in the background, uh, trying to go undetected. Oh, next slide, please. So let's, uh, can you build this one out? Thank you. So let's see uh, how Zero Trust uh, and Zscaler can provide um, that security transformation for your company. Uh, so Zscaler provides that full security stack in the cloud. And it's always available with no need to VPN in back to your data center. So whether you're working from home, the coffee shop, or you're always connected, you know, your laptop or your phone or your tablet is always connected up to the Zscaler Zero Trust Exchange. Um, that Zero Trust Exchange provides the full cybersecurity stack, uh, including SSL inspection, malware, AV, malicious URL policy, uh, controls, app controls, sandboxing to prevent day zero attacks, uh, DLP to detect data exfiltration, and, and much more. These engines within Zscaler operate as one and in parallel in the Zero Trust Exchange, really providing uh, fast inspection of traffic. Compare this to appliances which uh, are usually connected serially. All, all these things happen in parallel within Zscaler. Zscaler also provides that uh, secure access to private applications, uh, whether they're in the data center or in the cloud. The, the private applications, think of that as your, your private applications you're trying to secure in your data center and how you normally connect to via VPN. Uh, Zscaler private access can help you do that. These apps are now connected through the Zscaler Zero Trust Exchange. And this, con this direct connection to the Zero Trust Exchange makes them essentially invisible to the internet, uh, reducing an attack uh, surface entirely. After all, you can't, you can't attack what you can't see. With, with Zscaler, users are connected to apps, not the network. This really is important distinction because it eliminates that lateral movement problem. Uh, the Zscaler for users is really easy to deploy. We have a common agent on the, on, on the endpoint device, and you can connect to the internet or the private app securely all the time. Uh, the Zero Trust Exchange understands, ah, you're going to a private application, it connects you directly to that. You know, so the user doesn't have to think, do I have to turn on a VPN, do I have to turn it off? The, you always get the best experience because you're going direct to cloud through us. Security is always on and we connect the user directly to the application seamlessly. Uh, Zscaler really reduces that cost and complexity. We, we, we tend to eliminate those appliances that you trip, typically have to manage, maintain, or, or deploy. Uh, with Zscaler, you don't have to take care of that anymore. Uh, Proofpoint is a shell where they deployed uh, over, uh, uh, the, the, the agent in over 130,000 desktops uh, within a matter of six weeks. Oh, next slide, please. And you can build that up too. So, um, ne never trust, always verify. That that's like the main tenant of, of zero trust, and, and that's what how Zscaler works. The the zero, Zscaler zero trust exchange connects the the users, workloads, IoT, OT devices to other entities seamlessly and securely. We do this in five steps, essentially. One, we, we terminate the connection so that we can determine who you are. Once we determine <clears throat> where you're going, specifically what app you're trying to access, what internet destination you're trying to go to, uh, then we assess your context. Where are you coming from? What's your location? What's your device type? What's your posture of that device? To determine the level of risk that, that the, the connector is trying to to connect to. Uh, so once we determine that level of risk, we, we, we decide, right, should you be allowed to go directly? Uh, should we just present pixels through um, to you so that you can actually download things? Uh, just and so that's another level of security. After that, we execute things like inline inspection of both encrypted and unencrypted traffic to make sure you're not carrying any malware or other harmful content, essentially. This inspection is, is done at scale. We can, we can turn on SSL inspection for all users within an enterprise. 
and uh, we we run those multiple security engines in parallel so to determine that whether you're safe and we don't have that delay of running things in series if everything looks good finally we establish that connection um so uh can you click a couple of times uh, so i Unlike uh, traditional network security, which is based on uh, firewalls and, and VPNs, we, we don't allow pass-through connections. Uh, so compromised users or encryption threats can't access your access, assets, essentially. Um, but by, sorry, by applying uh, risk-based policies, we dynamically deny access to, to risky users. Uh, we block um, inbound threats or outbound threats, you know, like ransomware and inspect uh, all the traffic to prevent uh, any data loss uh, uh, risks. Finally, to eliminate that lateral threat movement, we connect users only to the application. We never connect the user to the network. Um, and one final detail is that Zscaler eliminates that attack surface entirely by having the application, that private application, make a connection to the zero trust exchange so it doesn't respond to probes on from the internet uh it's making it what so once you remove that attack surface it's you're making it essentially invisible from the internet uh next slide please uh so let's look at how we reduce um uh risk across a kill chain for example uh first through the Zscale Zero Trust Exchange, you can eliminate that attack surface that I mentioned by connecting users directly to apps, making uh, those apps invisible to attackers, eliminating lateral movement. Uh, second, we prevent that initial compromise through a set of capabilities, which include things like inspecting all traffic uh, encrypted over TLS or SSL. We block threats in line. Uh, and we apply your policies and sandbox suspicious files for further inspection. Now, the capability that I mentioned earlier is rendering email links as pixels only through our cloud browser isolation technology. So that's an important piece. Third, we, we don't put users or workloads on your network. We only connect, con create connections through our platform. Essentially, this uh, eliminates that threat of uh, lateral movement. Um, finally, our uh, cloud data loss prevention, CASB, uh, workload protection help you apply policies to stop data loss. Uh, all this uh, helps protect uh, your environment with Zscaler. It prevents, stops that kill chain, essentially. Next slide, please. So we understand that uh, Zero Trust is a team sport. It's, it's not delivered by one company alone because there's uh, different aspects, right? There's um, identity, enforcement, automation, analytics. So we partner with the leading vendors in each space so that it's easy to integrate with your existing tools. Uh, our tools, our integrations essentially leverage the open APIs that we publish and provide automation and visibility into our platform. For example, um, in the SD-WAN space, we have automations so that uh, your SD-WAN device so can set up connections to Zscaler with a single link, very easily done. Uh, in the endpoint space, we, we communicate to EDR vendors through APIs to determine device posture and exchange risk information. In the operation space, we provide logs so that hidden threats uh, or exercises like threat hunting can be performed. In the source space, uh, D3 has integrated with our APIs to perform things like automated automatic remediation uh, by leveraging our sandbox, adding URLs, I, uh, IP addresses, domains to our blacklist. Essentially, this automates uh, a, a lot of remediation, and so that things can happen, the response can be happen much faster. Take uh, threat hunting, for example. Uh, this, if done manually, would be quite laborious without automation, uh, but with uh, a SOAR provider like D3, they can run playbooks, which would really simplify exercises like threat hunting. Uh, with that, I'll pass the baton to, to Stan to talk about our integrations. Awesome, thanks Raheem, appreciate that. So just building on what, uh, what Raheem described in terms of uh, Zscaler and, and looking at where D3 sits in the space, 
So we are a, a pure SOAR product uh, within, within, the, within the infrastructure side of things there. Uh, we work with traditional, uh, we work with SASE models, we work with hybrid infrastructure. So we have multiple different ways of combining uh, the different, the different pieces and then utilizing uh, Zscaler as APIs to, as, as Raheem pointed out, to automate uh, processes for uh, both on the SOC, but also on, but also on the threat hunting side of it. Um, something that we're big proponents of is that um, whenever you're dealing with new data sources, uh, whether it's you know the items that are coming through your telemetry side from Zscaler, whether it's coming from outside uh, of those particular items, we were firm believers in that you, your your data sources should not affect your processes. And and we'll go into a little bit uh, a little bit more on in terms of how we handle that within the platform. And then finally, uh, because D three um, really builds on uh, on the integrations and that that we control. Uh, we're able to orchestrate and automate really across the full the full stack, uh, both correlating. It could be correlating across EDR, your SIM, uh, your SASE items, your emails, and, and we'll get into we'll get into all those cool items. So, Amrity, go ahead, please. Um, again, we do automate traditionally across the SOC tasks, um, and this could be all different tiers of SOC tasks. Uh, another thing that we're really big on is upskilling um, your analysts. So. We don't look at the product as going, okay, well, you, you've now implemented a SOAR product, we, you can now get rid of a whole bunch of people. Um, the idea of, of really um, bringing the SOAR product in and, and automating a lot of the tasks that um, otherwise would take a lot of time is that we want you to get more out of your people. We really want you to um, empower your, your SOC and, and your threat hunters uh, to be able to do more um, on, on that side of it. And again, just we'll get into the orchestration side of it there. Uh, in terms of SOC processes, uh, we really believe they need to be independent of the underlying technology. And what we mean by that is when, when we get into the code, uh, the, the no code side of the playbooks and how we build them out, um, what we really mean is that you can switch uh, technologies out. So if you're using you know, one SIM vendor the one day, you're using another SIM vendor the other day, <clears throat> we don't believe that your playbook should have to get completely rebuilt. Same thing. Um, if you're switching out an EDR or you're, or you're dealing with, um, you know, suddenly a, a different one for whatever reason, um, your process shouldn't have to change. It's it's simply a technology block within within the playbook. And the other great thing with within D3 is that it comes with over 300 plus utility actions. And utility actions are just pre-built things within uh, within within the scope of the system. Uh, it could be things such as um, simply processing a, a, an email naturally within within the environment without having to write your own um, without having to really write your own code to uh, to really disseminate the information so there's a lot of different uh, utilities that, that come along with the system so um, another important aspect as to where d3 is is different is that um, many sort products will function on sort of a one-to-one -one basis. So they'll receive telemetry from a tool. So maybe it's a, it, it, it's alert from, um, from something. It could be an alert from Zscaler. It could be alert from the EDR. It could be alert from a ticketing system, an email, SIM, what have you. And a lot of them have like a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, when, in other words, they receive that alert and then they immediately produce like an incident or case on it. Where D3 processes these in what we call an event pipeline. So everything that comes in will produce what we consider an event. Now, an event is something that it may be important to investigate, might not be important to investigate, but the idea is that we want to offload as much of the initial work from the analyst as possible. So in other words, once we ingest that into the system, the first thing we're gonna do is normalize all the data that comes in. Uh, this means that we can extract different artifacts. So that could be usernames, that could be file hashes, it could be IP addresses, whatever, uh, types of artifacts that are in there and then tag those artifacts um, and why that's important is because once they're tagged within our artifact uh, environment it means that we can immediately look at is there any related um, events that have come into the system that contain that artifact um, and that's really where step three comes in so once we have the event in the system and it's normalized we've extracted the artifacts we can do things like immediately send it off for enrichment so in other words if you're utilizing you know, some other type of a tool like a virus total or recorded future or some other type of tool that supplies that telemetry, we can automatically look it up. Likewise, if it's a, if it's a tool such as like Zscaler, for example, we can automatically take that file and either grab that file hash, look it up immediately in Zscaler and, and get that reputation if it's there already. 
we could also simply submit a brand new file into, Z, into Zscaler. So maybe this has come from an outside source and now there's a file that we want to submit to their sandbox. We want Zscaler's um, vast Intel to be able to go and work on that and then give us the results back. And that can all happen actually even at the event level. And then along with that is we can then correlate the events. So what that means is that once we've got results back and once we've got those artifacts, we can go and take those and look at, okay, is this artifact in any other type of an alert? So you're not limited to, well, we received this from one source and that's the only source that we can correlate across. We can correlate across any sources that we bring into the system um, at the event level. And then moving into, into stage four is dismissal and escalation. Um, so even at that level, we can look at it and go, okay, is it a benign threat? So in other words, if Zscaler comes back and says, you know what, this file really isn't anything to worry about, it's completely benign, it's got like a, a low score, why should the analyst have to deal with that? At that point, we can just simply automatically dismiss it and it'll go into dismissed queue. It doesn't necessarily mean that we delete it out of the system. It simply means that it's put to a place where it's a it's a far lower priority. We can dismiss it and, and people don't have to worry about it. It can be correlated back in and brought into the system, but maybe it's just, it's, it's unimportant for the time being. Versus ones that come back that are, you know, maybe nasty or, or extremely nefarious, and those can then get escalated into what we now consider an incident or a case where we can now run additional automations on, on those types of items. And so the concept of the pipeline is to take um, all that telemetry that's coming in from alerting systems and really um, enrich it, correlate it, and then get it to a point where from an analyst perspective, they're really only dealing with the high fidelity ones and, and we're getting rid of, we're getting rid of um, all the ones that, that might not be that important. Go ahead there, Amrity. Terrific. So now looking at Zscaler's um, integration with, with D3. So this is, um, again, this is it's a fantastic way to be able to orchestrate across what Zscaler provides. And, and as Raheem pointed out, um, it doesn't necessarily have to just be on the response side of it, it can be also on the threat hunting side of it. So if you're dealing with um, you know, getting threat intelligence and wanting to correlate that into the system and then automatically updating your denial list or your, or your white list, that can be done as a playbook. Um, within within the environment, versus you know other areas like I mentioned, like sending something off to the sandbox, pulling that report back, and then taking additional additional items, um, such as you know moving somebody into a quarantine group within uh, you know within ZI and Z and ZPA within Zscaler's environment in an auto in, a, in an automated fashion, and really building that workflow out so that it can happen uh, very quickly. Maybe you got checks and balances in place. In other words. Um, you know, it's not a totally automatic thing to move them into those areas, but it's a, it may just be a single click, and you can then fire you can then fire that particular item off. Go ahead there, Amrity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular workflow for um, for what we're going to look at in terms of in terms of the playbook side of things. So the idea behind this is that um, we're ingesting from a third party source that could be email, it could be some other some other type of area. But the point is it's got something attached to it or it, it has an associated file that we're going to send off to, to, a sound, to, to Zscaler Sandbox. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look um, at the events that have come into D3. Uh, we can take multiple events. We can then push them over uh, into, the incidents, into the incident space. And we're going to then basically do an upload to Zscaler and pull back that particular intelligence report. And what this is going to allow us to do is take that intelligence that comes back um, and basically break out any type of artifact um, within that report. So we can look at anything that might be related. Are there, are there URLs that are, that are associated with it that come back from the sandbox? Are there, um, you know, what's known bad in there? Um, are there processes that, that, that this item runs? Are the command line items that um, Zscaler's found within there that come back as part of that particular report? So anything that comes back, we can pull out. So if there are bad URLs present, um, we could add them then immediately onto the block list. We can, you know, update um, if there's a multiple affected endpoints, because what we can then do is we can then correlate back um, into the EDR and take to take a look to see is there other um, ED, you know, is there is there areas within the EDR that have that same file hash that may be present there within within their systems. Any if there are higher, you know, going moving up the stack there again. Um, entering a remediation phase. This is the quarantine part of it, which you know we'll talk a little bit more about as we get into it. But this allows us to isolate the users, isolate the endpoints in the EDR, and other actions that uh, that people may want to take. Uh, we can then check to see if the remediation action has been completed. So 
Um, oftentimes, it may not be the security team that's doing the remediation. Maybe it's a ticket off to the IT department that then is responsible for updating or, or meeting the, remediating these items. Um, that's another step that um, you know, could be triggered off based on you know, information coming back from a ticketing system to, to then kick off the last part of the playbook, which is then reinstating the user in, in, in ZIA and ZIP, you know, and then unquarantine the endpoint or other actions that may have to then be undone within, within the environment. And then finally, generating a summary report um, and then emailing it out to, to stakeholders. So these types of processes can be automated within, within a workflow. I'm going to take a look at that and I'll describe them in a little bit more detail as we go through. So within the playbook here, so this is a, this, these are going to be screen grabs and I'll describe what's, what's going on, but essentially the very start of it is what the, is what the playbook um, is. So this is like a Zscaler workflow. Uh, the first couple of uh, deeper purple blocks there that, that you see is really the upload and the pullback of the report. So again, these are codeless items and I, and I need to point this out is that there's no scripting involved by the teams that are utilizing this. These are out of the box integrations. Um, it becomes very easy to, for us to go in and set these up. And then we can extract the IOCs, which is what that teal box does. And then basically put a, put a control mechanism in there to go, have we found anything bad? Is there anything in that report that comes back that might be high risk or things that we, that we wanna look at? If not, go ahead and auto, go ahead and auto close it. If there are high risk items that come back, uh, we can then go into a correlation phase. And, and this is where the system starts becoming uh, more and more powerful. So we can query the EDR. We can then set up a SIM query for additional IOCs if we want to, want to look at those particular items. Additionally, we can set up a continuous monitor of the, of the EDR, which means we can then look at the events that are continuously coming into D3 on an ongoing basis and automatically correlate them back into the, sing, back into the singular case. And if you'll notice an important thing, and you know, Raheem talked about how important it is that items run in parallel in the Zscaler environment, D3 functions exactly the same. We're able to go and do things in a completely parallel um, area. So I don't have to wait for my EDR query to finish before I start my SIM query, before I continuously monitor additional items that are coming into D3. These tasks can all be run completely in parallel. Go ahead and move forward there, uh, Amrdi. So then in a couple other control mechanisms, is there any additional items that are found? If so, then let's go and add these into an affected EDR list. Let's go and add, you know, if there's additional URLs that are found within, within the environment, add those into, into that type of a list and then go into what we call, you know, response phase. So response phase, you know, you can remove the, you can remove the user out of ZIP, you can remove the user out of ZIA. Uh, you have the capability of then, you know, updating Zscaler's blacklist automatically. And um, then if we have to, you know, go ahead and isolate them at the, at the EDR point as well. And we can orchestrate all of these at the same time across the system um, without having to go into the ind individual uh, environments to do this. It becomes a way for the SOC to really go and condense the time that they're spending on um, each, each one of these particular tasks. And then as I mentioned before, um, and this becomes an important block, like how are you going to reinstate these, uh, the technologies? How are you going to reinstate the users in the, in the environment? You've got to have a mechanism to go and check. Um, is it going into like a ServiceNow instance where um, you know, you're having to wait for IT to update it? Uh, you know, this shouldn't be a manual process. Um, instead, we've got a mechanism where you can actually loop the timing. You can actually check to see, you know, when is this trigger coming in from, from ServiceNow to update the ticket and then go ahead and kick off the remediation side of it. So we can get confirmation from IT that yes, all these items have been remediated and have the system automatically go and reinstate the user. So in other words, it's not, doesn't have to be a manual task that then the SOC uh, reinitiates. It could just simply be part of the playbook that's running in the background while the analysts are, are, doing, are, are doing other items. Go ahead and move forward one more, one more there. And then finally, closing it all off. Um, again, this becomes important. We can generate a summary report. So you need that you know, full report, everything that's happened, you know, what automations were run, what you know, notes and different things that analysts find within, within the system. Um, are there steps that, you know, as part of the process that we need to change? And all of these things can be then generated into an automated, you know, PDF or Word report, and then emailed automatically to the stakeholders. Or maybe you're utilizing Slack or Teams or, or some other mechanism uh, to, to push out uh, the, these types of reports. But all of that can go into that particular channel and then automatically close the incident out so that the time frame that's spent by the analyst is on the, is on the, important, is on the important things. You know, 
Um, we're, we're big proponents of automation, but at the same time, you know, they, you want checks and balances in, in place, right? So maybe that check is an analyst looking at um, everything that's come back, as I mentioned before, like, you know, you might have thresholds, but maybe you want an analyst to go and check the results of those particular intelligence that's come in. Or maybe you want one more check before you're automatically removing a user or an endpoint off the system. Those are all things where you want human eyes on glass on those types of things, maybe prior to taking uh, taking those particular actions. So the idea behind a D3 playbook is an end-to-end -end workflow that really incorporates parallel tasking to really save as much time for the SOC as possible. Go ahead and move uh, forward one more slide. Uh, lastly, a couple things to, to point out here. Um, D3 is based off a case management system. So the entire SOAR platform is wrapped in case management. Um, and what this means both from the perspective of an enterprise or for, for example, an MSSP, is that everything can be tracked, logged, audit trailed. There's places to, um, you know, not just notes, but very granular notes. Um, there's a dynamic forming system in, in the environment that allows you to build out any type of form. So maybe you've got clients that have a particular compliance form that happens, especially on the DLP side. Uh, that have to be tracked and logged. All of these things can be built within within the case management side of it and have the automations uh, feed into this particular case. So um, understanding that's important because the SOC has a workspace that's their own. Um, it's all controllable uh, within the environment. So you can just pick and choose who sees what and who's able to do what within a particular platform. Go ahead, uh, Raheem, one more slide. And finally, metrics and reporting. And this is this is again uh, really big. How how much you know? What's your analyst load? How much time are you saving? Um, you know the numbers that you see across the top. You know the, the, they may look kind of arbitrary, but understanding that we can go pull the metrics down for how long is it taking my analysts to go through their review tasks within the environment? How long is it taking for my automations to run? All these things can be factored in, reported on, and then brought to a, a metrics dashboard. Uh, if you're an MDR or service provider, we've got the capability of breaking these out on a per tenant basis within within the system, so that each particular client can get their own their own metrics, their own their own and their own dashboard for maybe it's utilization, maybe it's mean time to respond, um, maybe you want to produce something around the SLAs that that the clients need to see. Uh, so all of these things can be contained within uh, within the reporting and metrics side within within D3 as well. Go ahead, Amory. Uh, for one more slide. With that, uh, Aradeep, maybe what I'll do is I'll hand it back to you, and we can we can get into a bit of a bit of a Q and A. Sure, thank you, thank you so much, Stan. Um, so we we received uh, a lot of questions while uh, you were giving your presentation. I'm just going to read the questions out for the ones of you um, who had questions but did not paste them yet. Um, just remember there's a $50 gift voucher waiting for you if uh, you ask questions. So feel free to type them in. Um, the first question that we have, I think this would be a question for you, Stan, is how does the tool work with EDR integration and which EDR integrations do you currently have? So everything will have a connector within within the environment. So the EDR tools will have either some type of a service account connector or some type of a tokenization system. Uh, there'll, there'll be a connector. And then from there, it's just the out of the box integrations that, that, are, that you need. Um, currently, uh, I, think, I think we integrate with pretty much every EDR within, within the space uh, on that side of it. So it's usually not a, not a problem. If you're looking for the list, um, if you go to, you'll, you'll see the link to the to the website at the end, but we've got a full list of the integrations that we have available. I think it's bridging somewhere close to 500 different integrations across different security tools. So uh, if we, yeah, take a, take a look there is the best place that, that I can tell you, but uh, I think we've got pretty much every major EDR out there. Okay. Um, the next question is probably best answered by Raheem. Um, with respect to the use case, when you send a file for analysis to Zscaler, what detection techniques does Zscaler use to detect a malicious file? And how robust is uh, that detection? Um, so 
Thanks for that question. So essentially the way the sandbox works is when we, when the file comes in as an attachment, uh, we download, we, we first see if it is a file that is already known in our database. Uh, if it's already known, then we can either automatically block it or, uh, or, or send, or, or basically send it down if it's, if it's safe. When a file is unknown, what we do is then we forward it into our sandbox. Our sandbox is essentially a, a virtual machine and we spin it up. Uh, and once we, once it sits there, we observe it. Does it is it doing anything weird? We try to accelerate time a little bit, uh, but it's, is it trying to touch processes? Uh, you see some things that a regular, a good program shouldn't be doing. And that's how we flag it. Um, our sandbox is pretty robust. It stops day zero attacks. What's also interesting is that we have the cloud effect. So if one customer downloads a new file that we've never seen before and we detonate it and we determine it to be malicious, that knowledge is then propagated to all uh, our cloud tenants. So automatically uh, an attack, uh, 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 someone else downloading a file from a different company entirely but that matches that same that same type, we will recognize it and we'll block it right away. So there's no detonation time involved. So as it, uh, the longer the sandbox runs, the, the, the more the cloud effect, uh, the, the basically the faster we get. Okay. Um, the next question is, would you elaborate more on no code from D3? Yeah, so... Sure, I can uh, absolutely. So we're, as I mentioned in the presentation, we're big proponents of utilizing your analysts' time for what they're, you know, what they're hired to do. We also believe that you know you shouldn't need a, a vast amount of coding or scripting capabilities within within the SOAR tool. So when when I was walking through the blocks that you had that I was showing within the playbook, um, for example, like let's take like the Zscaler, let's take the Zscaler uh, uh, different blocks, like the submit to sandbox and uh, into um, uh, and pulling the report. So both of those API calls are pre-built within the system. So in other words, utilizing those calls, I don't, I don't have to code anything. I'm not scripting anything. I simply, I simply point to where the file, so like for example, if I associate a file onto, uh, onto like a case, it'll have a file ID. And that file ID is right there. So all I have to do in the playbook is associate the file ID with uh, the input for for that block to send to, to send to Zscaler. That's it. I, I don't, there's, there's no coding. It's, it's literally pulling in the building block um, as, and associating it with, with that input parameter, which is very easy. So I'm not scripting anything. I don't have to do um, anything beyond that. And that's uh, the same thing with all of our integrations uh, that, that we keep up. So if you're doing something like, uh, you know, uh, pushing a, you know, a user, a group of users into a quarantine block within, within Zscaler, it's the same thing. You just need the user IDs um, as as the input. You're not having to code the block to use it, and 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 that list of user IDs is, is simply a placeholder within uh, within the information that comes that comes into the playbook. So hopefully that um, hopefully that answers a little bit more. Um, the next question is: We currently use Active Directory, and we set it up so that everything requires authentication. What's different with the zero trust architecture? Um, so essentially, you know, zero trust has several components, right? Um, the first one is identity. Uh, Zscale integrates with identity providers like uh, AD, Octa, Ping. Um, so identity is just determining, is one step, it's determining uh, who are you? Uh, the next step is really policy and enforcement. So policy, uh, is this identity allowed to access uh, that private resource, perhaps as an ordering system, as a payroll system, or, or some accounting system? Uh, so we determine that policy, uh, that user is allowed. That, that's just one piece. But the second piece is uh, the policy we determine, this user is a, perhaps as an administrator uh, or, or a regular user. And perhaps they shouldn't be accessing to these resources from uh, a foreign country. And so we determine uh, location. Another, another area we determine is, is posture. Um, so that, that user is determined to be risky before 
I, but when I tell when I say risky, I mean a uh, high value. Um, so therefore, the, his laptop, his endpoint device should really have the the latest EDR up and running. Let's say it's Carbon Black uh, or, or 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 CrowdStrike. So we then figure out what's the posture of that device, and then our our policy engine figures that out. And then we enforce it uh, to be allowed or to be blocked. So it's multiple. Uh, that, that's how Zscaler works so that it's its providers. Okay. Um, while we're uh, with you, Rain, there's also another question that uh, I'd like you to take. It says, for Zscaler, how does the traffic steering work with or without SD VAN? Sure. So uh, traffic essentially gets sent to Zscaler. Um, so if you have an SD WAN device, uh, the SD WAN device can break it off, let's say. I need to go back to my data center. It has that switching technology, but you don't have to use uh, uh, an SD WAN device. For example, for workers working remotely, uh, what we do is we we install the endpoint agent of the Zscale client connector on your on your laptop, and that is basic. That basically creates that tunnel uh, to the Zscale cloud. Um, you don't always have to do that mechanism if you're working in a in a in an office location. Your your edge router points to the Zscaler cloud over a GRE tunnel or IPsec tunnel. So then everybody in that branch is protected, including your IoT and OT devices. Okay, I think that's a, that's a great answer. Um, the next question that we have is. Are SOAR capabilities needed in a zero trust framework? Is it possible to implement ZTA without source automation and orchestration capabilities? Stan, could you take that question? Can you repeat that one more time? Are SOAR capabilities needed in a zero trust framework? Is it possible to in implement zero trust architecture? without source automation and orchestration capabilities? Um, I don't think it's a matter of implementing, you know, obviously Zscaler can be implemented without, uh, without, without the source side of it. I think where the SOAR brings the value is the fact that it allows you to orchestrate your workflows across um, all the different environments, right? So in other words, it gives you the capability to, um, it gives you the capability to essentially um, not have to run to all the different technologies, right? So, in other words, I can stay within I can stay within the the SOAR platform and you know do the blocks, do the submissions and in, into the sandbox if needed, um, and across other technologies for that matter, without ever leaving the SOAR platform. So, it's a matter of making the SOC more efficient on that side of it. Um, you know, I would. You know, the the zero trust model brings brings a huge amount of security uh, in into 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 the client's environment, as you know, Raheem's as Raheem's pointed out with with various areas there. Um, where we really bring the value is in you know what is the SOC or the threat hunter having to do, you know, automating those particular processes both across like the zero trust and um, you know if they're you know if they're running hybrid. Right. If they're if they still haven't totally transitioned over, you know, we have the capability of of, um, of you know orchestrating across multiple different types of models at the same time. So I think it's it, it's more along those lines um, that answers that question, Emery. Thank you very much, Stan. So um, with that, we have come to an end of our uh, Q and A and at the end of our webinar. I want to thank all of you for your time this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on. Uh, what part of the world you logged in from. And I also want to thank uh, both our speakers, uh, Stan and Raheem, for taking time out today. If you require um, any additional information regarding D3 or Zscaler or the integration, or if you just generally like to have a chat on Zero Trust and how it would be a good fit for you, or what are the steps that you should be taking on your Zero Trust journey, we're happy to um, schedule a more consultative conversation with some of our sales engineers or uh, with Stan, if, if you like, or with Raheem, if you'd like to reach out to him. So you could uh, just write to us at marketing at d3secretary.com and uh, we'll be sure to put you in touch. 
um, once again, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Thank you, everyone.